All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, seems like it's been forever since we've done this, uh, but uh, thank you again for attending. Uh, dedicated Outdoor Air Systems Part 2. Uh, my name is Buck Nye, President Owner of HCNI Company, and today Jim O'Donnell is going to continue um, uh, part two of our series on, on DOAS systems, psychrometrics. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, there will be Q&A that we will do towards the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, you'll see down at the bottom of your um, screen, there's a Q&A box. Uh, there's also, we'll be monitoring the online chat. And, uh, you know, we do record these webinars. So if there's someone that missed it that wants to see it, uh, we do have a YouTube page that we post the webinars to. And with that being said, uh, I'd like to introduce Jim O'Donnell uh, to continue the presentation. Hey, thanks, Buck. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Once again, uh, trying to ramp up back from the summer. Uh, as Buck said, we are recording this. And we will make that available afterwards. We can provide PDH credits, just uh, email myself or Gina O'Donnell. And then at the end, we do appreciate if you could take some time and just fill out the uh, short, simple survey just to help us with uh, what topics and questions, et cetera, uh, follow up that we can provide for you. All right, so let's get started. So, sorry. Is not moving. Okay, sorry, having a little technical difficulties with my uh, screen going through. Okay, sorry, here we go. <laughs> Have to work, learn how to use my keyboard. <laughs> okay, so just psychometrics part two. Back in June, we did part one. Where they were a little bit more normal or, or, or common uh, space temperatures. In part one, we emphasize that you should be able to use DX refrigeration to get your leaving air dew points. For part two, for today, we're gonna look at lower space temperatures and relative humidity levels. Our dew point temperatures are gonna be less than 40 degrees, and therefore we're gonna have to use a passive or active desiccant wheel. Just on our site chart, this is the approximate area of the uh, two parts that we are uh, talking about. And then just what we're gonna uh, emphasize today is you gotta remove the moisture uh, from your air, all right? So uh, our dehumidification process, so instead of doing a typical 75, 50% side, maybe we have 50% RH, maybe we have a archival storage where we wanna keep that a little colder and a little bit drier. So we're gonna keep, uh, for example, today, 65 degrees dry bulb, 30% RH with a 32 degree, 32, 33 degree dew point. There it is on our site chart. And what we wanna do is take our outside air and cool and dehumidify it so that our leaving air is less than our space dry bulb as well as uh, dew point temperature. Partial review of psychometrics, gonna go through quick. This is sort of a repeat from part one. Here's our psychometric chart, dry bulb temperature. Everybody's familiar with that. On the y-axis is the amount of moisture uh, as a water vapor that's in the air. It's also called specific humidity or humidity ratio. A unit of measure, grains of moisture per pound of dry air. Next is vapor pressure. We're gonna talk about uh, vapor pressure because we're gonna use that as we relate to the use of desiccants today. Vapor pressure, not the most common term, but it's the pressure exerted by the water vapor molecules in the air. And then just remember that air is a mixture of water uh, plus air uh, you know, components. And then just moisture is gonna travel on our site chart from higher vapor pressure to lower vapor pressure. Also dew point temperature, temperature at which a water vapor leaves air as a liquid. The dew point temperature, as everybody knows, is red on the left on the saturation line. Psychometric processes going through these quick again. For DOAS, we have uh, sensible cooling, uh, dehumidification with latent cooling, uh, cooling with dehumidification, combination of both. We also have uh, reheat. And then just for today, 
we're going to introduce a, another uh, psychometric process, which is heating and humidification. We're going to raise our dry bulb temperature and reduce our moisture levels. All right, so once again, emphasizing today, uh, how are we going to travel down our site chart to remove moisture from the air? So to remove moisture from the air, you have to lower your vapor pressure. There's two methods of doing that. Option number one is to use what I'll call mechanical cooling. We will have a DX refrigeration system or a chill water coil. That chill water coil would be hooked up to a chiller, uh, you know, some type of refrigeration system. The water vapor is going to condense out of the air. Option number two is to use a desiccant dehumidification where we're going to adsorb the water vapor from the air. So part one was using mechanical cooling. And then today, part two is going to emphasize the desiccant dehumidification. So back to part one for mechanical cooling. Everybody's familiar with our cooling process. We're going to uh, start with our outside air. First, we're going to run it uh, through our uh, DX evaporator coil. We're going to lower the uh, sensible temperature, and then we're going to provide uh, total cooling uh, with our uh, sensible and latent cooling. We're going to utilize our DX or chill water cooling system. But just for today, we're not going to uh, use, be able to use a DX or chill water cooling system. So what is your approximate minimum leaving air dew point temperature if you're using a DX system for dehumidification? What we found is that approximately it's about a 42 degree dew point temperature. This is maybe at the edge of our operating envelope, maybe a, a more appropriate Temperature might be 45, it gives us a little bit of a uh, you know, safety factor, et cetera, like that. What is the reason for only being able to reduce our DX leaving air temperature down to approximately 42 degrees? The limit has to do with our refrigeration temperature, the suction temperature that's in our evaporator. That temperature can reach about 36 or 37 degrees. Once again, you, you want to uh, leave a little bit of uh, space above uh, 32 degrees where you would have frosting on the coil. Now the problem with this DX coil, uh, leaving air temperature at approximately a 42 degree dew point is that if you have a space temperature with a lower dew point temperature, uh, an example would be 65 and 30 percent with 32, 33 degree dew point, our leaving air temperature at 42 degrees is not dry enough. Option number two that we're going to uh, explore further today is using a desiccant dehumidification system. First, we have our process air, which we are feeding to the space. We're going to add a desiccant wheel. On the other side of that desiccant wheel, we're going to add a second uh, airstream. Uh, the ASHRAE calls it scavenger air. Uh, the, the industry calls it reactivation or regen air. And what we're going to do is we're going to transfer moisture from the process air to our scavenger air. So back to our vapor pressure uh, on our site chart, we have a desiccant wheel. First, we're going to take our process air, we're going to transfer moisture to the desiccant wheel, and then next we're going to take that moisture from the desiccant wheel and remove it and transfer it to the scavenger air. Once again, our vapor pressure, our, your moisture is going to travel from your higher to lower vapor pressure. All right, so let's explain uh, HVAC desiccants. This is a very simple version. If you look uh, on the uh, uh, internet in ASHRAE, there's a ton of information, all right? But for our, uh, our uh, uh, application in HVAC, we're gonna kind of do it as specialized. So what are desiccants? Desiccant is a material with a high affinity to absorb or adsorb uh, moisture uh, or water vapor from the air. Some common, um, Examples of desiccants, the one on the left is what you often see when you uh, get a shipment with silica gel with the, uh, the big warning not to eat this. In our refrigeration systems, we have a filter dryer where the uh, dryer uh, portion has a desiccant in there to remove condensables, et cetera, from our refrigerant temperature. And then the last one on the right is for a uh, air compressor system where you have, once again, a desiccant to dry the temperatures as a compressor uh, provides uh, you know uh, air at a very high pressure with a you know we want to have a low dew point on that. So adsorption uh, for our desiccants with our HVAC is a process where the water vapor adheres to the surface of another substance. An example of absorption is to, is with a sponge. 
uh, that sponge would be called an adsorbent. So adsorption is we're adding moisture to the surface of that sponge. And the uh, desorption is a removal of water vapor from the surface of that sponge. So our HVAC version, water desiccants, they do come in liquid or solid form. For today, we're gonna really just look at the solid form. The different types of desiccant available, there's like five or six different ones. The two most common used in HVAC are silica gel as well as molecular sieve. Just a, a generic description of each of the molecular sieve and silica gel desiccants is that it contains a crystalline structure. That crystalline structure is shown uh, magnified on the left, but basically what it is is you have an empty uh, porous cavities uh, inside the structure where those cavities uh, capture and then release water vapor. Uh, once again, the desiccant adsorbs and desorbs uh, on the surface are moisture based on a vapor pressure differential. Once again, just to emphasize the vapor pressure, the water vapor is always going to move from a high to a lower uh, vapor pressure. Just a quick comparison, a simple comparison of silica gel versus, versus molecular sieve. The first has to do with moisture removal capacity. Here's a graph, once again, uh, you know, uh, very commonly uh, shown on the internet and ASHRAE, et cetera, like that. We're on the, the x-axis, on the bottom, you have your percent RH, and on the y-axis, you have the amount of moisture that your uh, silica gel or molecular sieve can absorb. The red line is silica gel, the blue line is molecular sieve. So from a moisture removal capacity, the silica gel, uh, uh, at the higher uh, relative humidity uh, applications from 50 up to a 90%. I'm gonna kind of qualify myself just to say it can be better at these higher RH applications. And then molecular sieve, as the graph shows in the blue there, it can be better at the lower uh, RH applications. Just wanna emphasize that uh, for today's uh, presentation, um, you know, we're, we're agnostic for what type of uh, desiccant you're going to use, whether it's silica gel or molecular sieve. The second part uh, that might be a, a, a difference between the silica gel and molecular sieve that I just wanted to emphasize has to do with carryover or cross-contamination. Uh, molecular sieve can be better versus silica gel regarding, uh, you know, less uh, cross-contamination that the manufacturers uh, can, how they uh, manufacture the molecular sieve, they can adjust the different size of the uh, pores or the openings in the molecular sieve. Um, these can range from three angstrom up to a combination of, uh, you know, next is a combination of three and four angstrom material. There's also four and five angstrom. Just highlighted the three angstrom that, uh, you know, company Senko that we, uh, REP uh, is well known for having a, uh, a molecular sieve uh, desiccant that is a true three angstrom size, and that specific three angstrom uh, molecular sieve only allows certain molecules to be transferred, uh, doesn't allow certain contaminants to be transferred from one airstream to the other. A common use of desiccants that I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with has to do with energy recovery wheels. Desiccant, once again, on the surface of the energy recovery wheel is transferring moisture. Uh, we're transferring uh, latent energy. But just realize that a desiccant uh, wheel is not an energy recovery wheel. What the desiccant wheel is, is the manufacturers apply, you know, excuse my French, a crap load of a desiccant onto the, uh, the uh, rotor uh, wheel. Uh, these range from greater than 50% up to 75% of the total weight. There are two different types of desiccant wheels. The first one uh, is type one. I'll, I'll call it type one as a passive desiccant wheel. The second one is considered to be an active desiccant wheel. Now each of these wheels transfer, transfer the moisture in a similar uh, fashion that basically we're transferring the moisture from the process air to the desiccant on the desiccant wheel and then we're rejecting the moisture uh, from the desiccant on the desiccant wheel to the scavenger or a reactivation air. Now the difference between the passive and, des and active desiccant wheels has to do with the, uh, on the scavenger air 
or, reje or moisture rejection side. Basically, our passive desiccant wheel to reject the moisture doesn't require additional energy, whereas our active desiccant wheel does require additional energy. I'll explain a little bit more the differences between uh, the two wheels. So first, with the passive desiccant wheel, uh, you know, here's your uh, similar um, uh, you know, process or just the, the, the uh, desiccant wheel uh, uh, equipment that we showed uh, earlier. On the scavenger air, we're able to use a lower air temperatures. Oftentimes, this is at return air uh, conditions. Whereas our active desiccant, where we have to add uh, energy, we take our same desiccant wheel system. We add in red here uh, a, uh, an energy source to uh, you know, greatly heat up our air. That energy source is typically gas, electric, or steam. And then it, uh, in recent years, it has also started transitioning to hot water temperatures where they're using uh, regeneration uh, energy from solar, et cetera, like that um, in the desiccant uh, wheel, uh, active desiccant wheel process. A simple explanation of a passive desiccant wheel without our energy system. It's considered to be the Cromer uh, cycle. Um, we have our um, HVAC uh, system here. Uh, at point one, we have our return air uh, returning from our system. We then travel through a desiccant wheel to point two. Point number three uh, travels through a cooling coil. And then from point three to point four, we travel through the other side of the desiccant wheel. Um, I just put two stars here because I ended up uh, changing this slide or moving this slide up in the presentation uh, versus the, uh, the, the slide deck that we sent out yesterday, all right? So uh, that's our, uh, you know, uh, our, our direction of our airflow using a passive desiccant system or the Cromer cycle. Here it is on our site chart. On the bottom, once again, we have dry bulb temperature. On the Y axis, we have our uh, amount of moisture. Initially, we start off from point one to point two. We go through one side of des the desiccant wheel. We are adding moisture and we are cooling the air from point two to three. Uh, this is a typical uh, you know, cooling coil. The cooling coil is providing uh, total cooling. It is reducing our dry bulb temperature and also reducing our um, moisture levels. And then the third, uh, three, three to four, is going to the other part of the desiccant wheel. Uh, the desiccant wheel in this situation, uh, you can see once again, we're traveling lower on our uh, site chart, so we're removing moisture. And then we're traveling from left to right, and we are increasing our dry bulb temperature. So just as a comparison from point uh, our finishing point at point four versus our starting point at point number one, our air has been cooled and dehumidified. Right, so comparing a passive versus active desiccant wheel, uh, just a quick comparison. The passive desiccant wheel is typically used on what I'm calling medium dry uh, dew point temperatures, where they're in the 35 or 40 or 45 degree range. They're closer to uh, uh, what you can achieve with a typical uh, DX chill water system. Our active desiccant is uh, used when you have to achieve or, or, or provide much lower dew point temperatures. Uh, you can provide systems uh, in the single uh, grains, you know, very low uh, dew point temperatures. Uh, in terms of passive, the passive system has lower first cost, it has lower operating cost. And then the active desiccant wheel has higher first cost because we're be, be, uh, due to the uh, the the um, desiccant that's on the wheel, as well as the additional energy that's required. And then once again, it has higher operating costs because we're adding that additional energy source. And then for today's uh, presentation, we're going to uh, focus on this active desiccant wheel uh, system. All right, so let's go into a little bit further detail explaining how active desiccant dehumidific dehumidification systems work. Uh, here's once again our active desiccant uh, uh, schematic. We have our uh, two air streams. We're tra transferring moisture from our process air to the wheel to our scavenger air. We have the addition on, on the scavenger air side of additional energy. 
On our site chart, we're going in direction number eight, where our process air is being heated as well as humidified. All right, so let's go step by step through how the active desiccant wheel works. So we have our active uh, desiccant wheel in the center here. We have our inlet air on the process side at approximately 45 degrees dry bulb and 35 grains of moisture. On our reactivation on our other airstream, uh, we usually use outside air. Uh, for this situation, we're gonna start at 82 degrees and 128 degrees uh, of, of, of grains. We're gonna have our energy source where we're gonna greatly uh, increase the temperature of the air uh, after our heater to 250 to 320 degree range. What we'll end up doing is we're gonna spin our active desiccant wheel extremely, extremely slow. Uh, 15 uh, rotations per hour, uh, you know, even in some situations less than that. What ends up happening is our, our, our process air leaves uh, with a warmer dry bulb temperature and a lower grains. And then what we've done is we've, uh, our reactivation air, we've cooled the reactivation air, but then we've loaded it up with a ton of grains. What is happening once again is that um, desiccant uh, that's glommed on to the, uh, our wheel here, we're gonna take moisture in and out of the desiccant. We're gonna transfer moisture from our process air to the desiccant, and then we're gonna reject the moisture from the uh, desiccant to our reactivation or regen air. Here it is on our site chart, our process air. We're starting in our upper left, close to the um, uh, saturation line with 45 degrees of grains. We're gonna go through our wheel. We're gonna lose, we're gonna uh, raise our dry bulb temperature as well as uh, reduce our moisture. The dry bulb temperature is rising for two reasons. One is it has to do with the heat of absorption as the water vapor is evaporated from the uh, airstream, it then, uh, from an energy perspective, uh, raises the dry bulb temperature. Uh, and then in addition, the heat from the reactivation air uh, travels across the, uh, the, um, the wheel from the activation uh, side to the uh, process air side. What is happening is that our vapor pressure of our process air is greater than the vapor pressure of the desiccant, you know, hence why we're, we're transferring moisture um, out of the desiccant wheel, I'm sorry, out of the process air to our uh, desiccant. Our reactivation air, once again on our site chart, we're starting off at our, uh, you know, typical uh, outside air design conditions. We're then taking that reactivation air through the uh, heater our reactivation air goes off our you know, typical site chart up to the 250, 320 degree range. And then on the other side of the uh, desiccant, active desiccant wheel, we're then uh, cooling the air, but then we're loading it up with a ton of uh, moisture. Once again, this is off of my you know, typical site chart uh, that you, you know, normally would work with. Uh, once again, just to understand the vapor pressure of the desiccant is higher than the vapor pressure of the reactivation air, hence why we're transferring moisture uh, into the reactivation air. Other considerations when you have an active desiccant dehumidification system, uh, just realize that your process air versus your ambient air has a large uh, dry bulb temperature difference, large dew point temperature difference. You should be concerned about the wall construction uh, you should uh, look into maybe providing a thermal break, to, thermal break to prevent sweating. Just realize once again from the previous slide that our reactivation air of 300 grains is just loaded with moisture. So you should be careful about corrosion. And then realize with your e regeneration, if that if you are using uh, direct fired gas heat versus indirect uh, gas heat, there's uh, you'll add moisture to the process air side and slightly increase our leaving air temperature, um, the grains of our leaving air temperature. Want to just emphasize also too that with these uh, active desiccant systems, uh, almost almost all the time, all the time, the controls are factory installed by the manufacturer. The manufacturer to me has the uh, know-how and expertise and experience uh, how these systems work versus a traditional uh, ATC vendor. Um, just the, the, the um, you know, the, the uh, equipment 
um, has uh, you know requirements for capacity control as well as uh, safeties that uh, the manufacturer once again is all uh, all encompassing, all familiar with those uh, situations. All right. Other items, just uh, footnotes or rules of thumbs. The reactivation air is typically uh, used a lot of times it's outside air. Uh, typically the equipment is located outdoors. Just the rotor uh, division or split between the two air streams uh, can be the 50-50 traditional uh, uh, you know, energy recovery wheel, but more times than not, the, the process air is about 75% of the airflow versus 25% of the reactivation air. Our process air is about three times the, the quantity of, of air flow versus reactivation air, example, 900 versus 300. And then just realize the limits of the uh, moisture removal of a desiccant dehumidification system is about 30 or 40 degrees of, uh, or 30 or 40 grains. And then also to just realize that the process air as it goes through that desiccant wheel rises approximately 30 to 40 degrees. Now that 30 to 40 degrees can be a problem. Once again, back to our site chart. Um, once again, to get to the 45 degree, uh, 35 grains, you have to add a pre-cooling uh, system. And then once again, our leaving as, uh, side, um, you know, 75 degrees, is that too warm or do you have to cool it? You would cool it by adding a post-cooling uh, uh, system. When I, now, when I say pre and post-cooling uh, uh, systems, are they required on our active desiccant system? Where I'm referring to is you have a cooling coil uh, upstream of our desiccant wheel as a pre-cool, and then you have a cooling coil downstream of our desiccant wheel as your, as your post-cool. The main considerations if these coils are required, first off is your what is your late leaving air dry bulb temperature? Next is what is your leaving air grains or dew points? And then the other factor that comes into play is also the amount of outside air. So first looking at the pre-cooling coil, um, out of our three main topics with the pre-cooling coil, the most critical one or the one that comes into play the most regarding the, the need for the pre-cooling uh, pre coil is what is your amount of outside air? Just typically rules of thumb, if your outside air is less than 20%, what ends up happening is that your return air from your space that you've already cooled and dry, dried is cold enough and you do not need a, a pre-cooling coil. Now the opposite of that is if your outside air is 100%, in this situation your outside air is too warm and wet as it enters the desiccant wheel. So in that situation you do require a pre-cooling coil. Now the Goldilocks or somewhere in the middle is if you have an outside air in the 50% or mid range between those two extremes. Uh, once again, your return air that you've already sent to the space, I'm sorry, your supply that you've already sent to the space and then comes back as return air is typically cold and dry enough already. But our outside air, uh, once again, is uh, too warm and wet. So what you often do is you just add a pre, you add a pre cooling coil but instead of doing the entire airstream, you just pre-cool or treat the outside air. So that's your pre-cooling. Let's look at post-cooling. Once again, for our three main factors, the typical most common uh, requirement is your leaving air temperature. A lot of times, you know, that's your, once again, you're, you're on your site chart, you're leaving air temperature at 75. Um, what is your leaving air temperature uh, that's required for your space to get down below that 75? A lot of times this becomes more so application specific. Say if you had an ice rink or a wastewater treatment plant, for example, 75 degrees would be a, a, a good leaving air temperature. Uh, you know, your parents in your ice rink uh, might like the uh, warmer temperature instead of being so cold. But then if you do have a manufacturing or a storage process where you need leaving air temperature less than 75, you would have to add a post cooling coil. And then just be careful or just realize that with that post-cooling coil, that because our air is so dry, that post-cooling coil is doing 100% sensible cooling. You're not adding any more moisture removal. And then always when you're selecting DX coils, uh, DX are traditionally sized for 75% sensible cooling, 30% uh, latent cooling in terms of your, your percentage. Uh, just in this situation here, once again, be careful is that your DX coil is going to be doing 100% uh, sensible cooling. So be careful 
uh, of your size when, when uh, picking that. All right, so next let's talk about the leaving air temperature design of the DOAS system. Uh, I'm also gonna call it a desiccant dehumidification system. Uh, my little acronym that I made up today was DDH equipment. These are, um, you know, these next slides are sort of a repeat for part one. So if you have a DOAS system, once again, your airflow is typically sized for outside air. You typically follow 62.1. Uh, if you have a DOAS or actually a desiccant dehumidification system, uh, you should also, or in this situation, uh, for your cooling capacity, you want to size this for latent cooling. You want to pick the appropriate leaving air dew point or grains. Once again, there it is on our site chart, um, you know, on the Y. Uh, repeat from uh, part one, just to emphasize once again, is what outside air design conditions are you using? Uh, ASHRAE has a whole bunch of different um, numbers for 4%, uh, 0.4% of the year, 1% of the year, 2% of the year. Uh, do some engineering houses use different conditions? So as an example for Philadelphia, uh, the dehumidification design, which is your maximum latent cooling load, uh, those are your uh, conditions there. If you were doing uh, cooling design, just realize that that uh, design temperatures or design conditions are the maximal sensible load. You can see there's a difference uh, between the grains um, and the enthalpy of the two uh, conditions. Want to make sure that when you're designing DOAS or, or dedicated, I'm sorry, desiccant dehumidification systems, that you are using the uh, dehumidification design conditions. Just to go through an example, if I should uh, show the differences from a uh, latent cooling load perspective. So say if you have a space that's at 65 degrees, 30% RH, there's our dew point temperature and our, our grains. We wanna provide uh, latent cooling. So per 1000 CFM of airflow, if we start with our dehumidification design, that's uh, 69 MBH, a little bit less than six uh, nominal uh, tons of latent cooling. If we used our cooling design, which is our sensible cooling, we would have a, uh, a requirement or design of 54 MBH. So just realize once again, that there's an approximate in this situation, 25 or 30% difference. So be careful once again, sizing your equipment. The second part uh, has to do with your space conditions. So we have a design of 65 or 30%. What is actually acceptable? Uh, can the relative humidity uh, rise by 3% or 5%? Can our dry bulb uh, rise by 3% or 5%? What we want to look at is what is our upper limit of our space conditions? Uh, this is what you usually use for your design conditions. So here, once again, we have our space conditions in the yellow. I drew just a little crude box to show what the range is of the uh, space temperature if we were you know, plus or minus five degrees, plus or minus 5% RH. Uh, our upper limit, uh, we could be, is it 75, 30% or are we a little bit tighter? And then also too, you also have to always be cognizant is how accurate are our space loads. It's pretty easy to come up with the outside air CFM, uh, lights or computer. The tricky part has to do with your process uh, sensible um, lows and your process latent lows, a lot of times or almost all the times that I've come across that, that information is very hard to find or, it's, or you make a lot of assumptions um, about what you think uh, might be occurring. Once again, what space conditions? So as an example, how much latent cooling? This is once again using a that per 1,000 CFM of airflow. My design is those Philadelphia dehumidification design conditions. So part one, uh, design number one with the leaving air dew point of 35. This is how much latent cooling we would require. If we had a leaving air temperature with a dew point of uh, 30 degrees, uh, this would be our uh, 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 latent cooling uh, capacity. Once again, there's not really much of a difference between the two conditions, but then just realize once again that uh, this five or 10% could be added to the previous uh, design um, uh, you know, in, input uh, conditions, I'll call them. All right, other considerations when you have a, a space with a low dew point, as I mentioned before, um, you know, how accurate our space loads is pretty tough with our process is sensible. Other things to realize is that, uh, you know, these spaces really, really want to emphasize uh, have to have a vapor barrier. The moisture is going to travel through the structure 
uh, from high to low vapor pressure. That's going to travel irregardless if you pressurize uh, one side versus the other. This will travel once again through the walls, uh, your ceiling slash roof. Also, you have to be concerned about your floor, whether you have uh, a grade or basement down below. Other things to be cognizant of or careful about is that these lower dew point temperatures, uh, often uh, you know, static electricity is easily uh, generated. Uh, the processes that are occurring, uh, is there the possibility of explosion or, or, or flammability? And then once again, uh, for uh, people, are there uh, people that are in these spaces, are they wearing just simple gowns or do they have a full-fledged uh, PPE where if the, um, you know, could be, you know, make them uncomfortable uh, inside the space if they're there for an extended period of time, all right? Last couple slides here, let's talk about what passive and active desiccant systems uh, HC9 has available. Uh, once again, the TOUT HC9, uh, we've been around since 1977. Um, you know, Buck Nye is our president, uh, manufacturers representative engineers and applied HVAC systems. There's our uh, logo, there's our website in the upper right. Once again, we're here to support, uh, you know, you guys, and gals uh, from conceptual design all the way through commissioning, all the way to uh, end of owner training. Uh, we have these, all these different types of equipment, all these different applications. Uh, you know, probably should have added a few other uh, items here for applications as, uh, as we're talking about active desiccant systems become a little bit more uh, industrial and manufacturing uh, based uh, systems. Uh, we have two offices in King of Prussia as well as Harrisburg. We run equipment service and there's each a sales, a sales a part store. In each of them, there's a, a picture of our training room, which is gathering you know, dust because of these great uh, <laughs> uh, webinars that we're uh, hosting. Appreciate you all attending that. And then once again, just want to emphasize that we have a bunch of old people here with a, uh, you know, a lot of uh, sales experience, a lot of experience with uh, problems and troubleshooting, uh, design, systems, application, it's, you know, controls, et cetera, all that. So what uh, HCNI has available for desiccant dehumidification uh, equipment? First on the passive side, where we're using uh, return air, you know, following that Cromer cycle. We have Annex Air, Novel Air, as well as Semco. There's a couple of, uh, you know, icons of each of those manufacturers. And then from the active- You need to note that, that we only have Annex Air in Central and Northeast Pennsylvania. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in the next uh, slide. Okay. So, and um, yeah, so active, um, I'm oh, sorry, active, where we're using energy, we have uh, uh, Climate by Design, CDI, Novel Air, as well as Simco. All right, so first with uh, Annex Air, once again, want to just emphasize that we do not have Annex Air in the Philly area, as well as uh, South uh, Jersey. There's Annex Air's website. Annex Air is focusing on or, or using a passive with the Cromer cycle that I demonstrated or showed uh, just quickly before. Annex Air is uh, specialized in custom uh, packaged CX systems with energy recovery. They've been around for over 20 years based out of Montreal, uh, Canada. Uh, what their uh, you know, strength is uh, has to do with being innovative with uh, manufacturing. Uh, thermal composite panel is a good example. And then they do have full-fledged uh, factory testing uh, and they do have a very strong uh, controls division for uh, sequence of operations and factory installed controls, complicated systems such as that. Uh, dual wheel, dual plate, uh, heat pipe, uh, all different types of energy recovery systems. And then once again, to emphasize the package ZX system, they uh, do make these uh, you know, custom with their water cooled or air cooled. Some uh, unique applications is where they have 100% redundancy with two uh, you know, different air streams or two different uh, refrigeration systems in the same um, uh, same air stream, uh, you know, also dual, dual, dual air path units. Next is Semco. Semco has been around for, you know, they're older than me, which is very old. Uh, Columbia, Missouri, uh, they're uh, known for their total uh, uh, insensible wheels, really their total one up to 70,000 CFM with a heavy duty aluminum uh, matrix, aluminum honeycomb. There's a picture of it there on the right. Uh, what molecular, uh, sem uh, manufacturing their wheels with a molecular sieve. 
with the true three angstrom uh, pore opening that I mentioned earlier. This three uh, angstrom opening has extremely low uh, exhaust air tran that's, uh, tra transfer ratio. This is the amount of cross contamination. Uh, it is AHRI certified. And then that matrix has some specialty uh, options or standards also included where that uh, these energy wheels can be used to recover energy from class four air. They've been doing that down at John Hopkins in uh, Maryland for a uh, number of number of years. Uh, these, uh, you know, uh, coatings uh, on the, uh, the matrix of the honeycomb of the wheel is the, you know, the acid resistant and it's antimicrobial, is anti-corrosion, and then they also have a version with uh, Teflon with anti-stick. <coughs> Example of that would be for a casino where the, uh, you know, the smoke does not stick to the uh, energy recovery wheel. Uh, so Semco has uh, some pre-engineered manufactured uh, products. Uh, first, we're going to look at their passive offering, where these can be a DOAS unit or a uh, I want to say dedicated, <laughs> but it's really a, a dehumidification, a desiccant dehumidification uh, system. They're available as uh, you know, DX coil with a remote condenser, but also packaged. The first one is a pinnacle. I'm going to call this pinnacle number one. We're using a passive desiccant wheel as well as energy recovery. Uh, these typically have a leaving air dew point around 40 uh, grains or so. Uh, they are available from 2,000 up to 40,000 CFM. There's a picture of it there. I want to just uh, emphasize once again that this is pre-engineered. We're similar. We're following sort of following the, the Cromer cycle, except with the uh, we're not doing that loop around. Uh, just uh, you know, highlighting uh, interior of the units. They have uh, you know, different filtration available, different fan uh, walls, fan, uh, um, fan arrays. Uh, you have an energy recovery wheel. Where you can uh, spec specify the, the low um, cross contamination, your cooling coil, and then downstream in the orange is our passive desiccant wheel. Here's our two you know, just air streams that are side by side. Uh, once again, um, you know, we're taking our outside air we're reducing the uh, dry bulb and uh, you know, reducing the, the temperature and dry bulb by running it through the energy recovery wheel. We're further depressing that with the cooling coil. And then our passive desiccant wheel is, uh, a cool, is uh, humidifying the wheel further and then providing some reheat. Uh, you can incorporate a return air bypass. Um, so you can use this you know, not just for uh, dedicated outside air, but also for unoccupied at times at night. And then what's unique about the system and using a passive desiccant wheel is that that downstream passive desiccant wheel can be uh, used in the winter time. What will happen by you know, spinning that wheel slowly in the winter, we'll end up raising our uh, defrost temperature on a return air exhaust air side. And then in addition, we'll also save uh, further energy by using that passive desiccant wheel. That's pinnacle number one. Pinnacle number two that they just came out with recently is that they're taking that same uh, Pinnacle One design. They're adding a DX system. Once again, this is pre-engineered. It's available from those CFM, those sizes. I uh, didn't have a good picture to kind of uh, show this in detail. But what I'm trying to show is that what they're doing is they're adding a refrigeration circuit to, uh, to our unit. On the outside air slash supplier side, they're adding an evaporator coil that's downstream of the cooling coil and then upstream of the passive desiccant wheel. On the exhaust air, return air side, they're then adding a condenser coil. This condenser coil is upstream of the passive desiccant wheel. What will end up happening is that this refrigeration system is going to lower our supply air temperature and then taking the condenser coil uh, heating, or the energy that's heated there, we're gonna be able to provide uh, you know, higher uh, reheat temperatures on our supplier. Once again, this is a comparison versus the Pinnacle One. And then just to emphasize once again on our site chart that we're uh, driving our dry bulb uh, temperature, uh, you know, a little bit higher for reheat and then removing more moisture from our, uh, from our air versus our Pinnacle One. Uh, Semco also has a active desiccant unit that can be used for DOAS as well as for uh, desiccant humidification. 
Uh, there's a picture of a package unit on the right there. Uh, that uh, you know, reddish uh, wheel is an active desiccant wheel. Uh, once again, this is all pre-engineered up to 20,000 CFM. There's like five or six different uh, box sizes. Um, these are, uh, you know, have a leaving air dew point lower than the passive desiccant in the uh, 15 grains, you know, or even lower uh, situation. Once again, these are taking a traditional uh, active desiccant system with our two uh, air streams, and then we're adding the regen heater that's shown in the uh, purple on the right of that picture there. And then once again, uh, just to emphasize is that these this system here has options for pre or post cooling coil. They can also add a re return air recirculation damper uh, to um, you know help with um, you know unoccupied uh, conditions. And then they do have an option to add an injury recovery wheel upstream of the system, similar to what was shown on the uh, Pinnacle unit. Next, Novel Air Technologies. Uh, they're out of Louisiana, been around for a little more than 15 years. They do have total and sensible energy recovery wheels. They do also make passive and active desiccant wheels. They do have packaged desiccant dehumidifiers. These are active. Uh, from a commercial perspective, these are active, but they do add as a package DX system. Once again, this is similar to kind of what uh, Semco was just shown. They add an evaporator coil to our process air side, and then they add a condenser coil to our uh, you know, reactivation air uh, upstream or desiccant wheel. These are available up to 15,000 CFM. They uh, have two different types for normal HVAC operation. First is a recirculating unit, where this provides neutral leaving air. They do have a DOAS unit, where it's 100% outside air, where they add an energy recovery wheel, once again, upstream of our desiccant wheel. In that situation, they're able to achieve leaving air temperatures you know, a little bit less than 45. And then uh, they do have available a uh, cold environment uh, you know, product line that could be used for ice rinks as well as for refrigerated warehouses, you know, situations where you have to, uh, you know, provide uh, lower uh, dry bulb temperatures and therefore lower dry bulb temperatures. You want to uh, dry out the air, uh, you know, properly so that you don't have fogging uh, inside of your, uh, you know, these cold air environments. You know, hockey players don't like uh, to not be able to see that well with uh, fog. Uh, last product that we're going to talk about is uh, uh, Climate by Design, uh, short CDI, located in Minnesota. Um, been around for uh, 30 years. I want to emphasize that uh, CDI um, has industrial grade um, equipment with a very uh, robust um, uh, cabinet, uh, construction uh, components, et cetera, like that. They do uh, achieve low dew point temperatures, and then they can uh, achieve uh, ultra low dew point temperatures down to minus 76 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, you know, from their website. Uh, once again, in, it emphasizes industrial grade. They have a, a design of a no through metal cabinet. This is available from two and a half inches, uh, four inches up to six inches thick. Their rotor system is uh, uh, once again, an upgrade from a traditional uh, 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 energy recovery wheel. They have a seven-year warranty. They have dual contact seals to prevent cross And then what really sets it apart is instead of using a belt or a linkage belt, their drive system actually has a chain that's shown there. Uh, and then there's also a gear tooth with uh, sprockets. These are easily uh, you know, removed from a maintenance perspective. From a product standpoint, the, the uh, product that we uh, use or come, at least I come across the most is a dry climate where it's taking um, you know, air from uh, 500 up to 2200 CFM. It can be located indoors and outdoors. It has a double wall uh, stainless steel cabinet. Uh, once again, factory installed uh, controls. Uh, has an option for a pre or post cooling coil box. That's what's shown in the lower left hand uh, corner there. Additional products that uh, CDI has for recirculation units where you uh, don't have that much outside air. They have packaged products up to 15,000 CFM. 
They also have a custom line up to 100,000 CFM where you can add different uh, energy recovery devices, different filtration, uh, UVC lights, et cetera, like that. They have a makeup air uh, line where it's 100% outside air from 3,000 up to 3,800 CFM. Uh, similar to other products uh, by the other manufacturers, they're incorporating an energy recovery wheel as well as an active desiccant system. For the ultra low dew point, where these are the ones, once again, to the minus 40 or minus 75 degree Fahrenheit, uh, applications are dry rooms, uh, such as, uh, you know, test chambers. Um, these are available, you know, pre-engineered sizes, also available as a custom design. And then their last one is they call it a crit critical process rooftop unit, where this is, uh, once again, pre-engineered, but then also customizable. A lot of times this is used in the food processing industry with a sanitary casing, as well as indoor air quality options, um, you know, with uh, UVC lights, et cetera, like that. These also incorporate air pressurization, you know, much tighter temperature and humidity control, and then, uh, you know, high filtration uh, effect as well, too. All right, coming to the end here. So we have, uh, you know, today, uh, part two on psychometrics, wanted to emphasize the importance of moisture removal sort of apologizing that I sort of transitioned to dedica from dedicated outside air to dehumidification using uh, desiccants. Uh, just simply explain desiccants from an HVAC uh, version, just emphasizing the moisture trans transfer. Wanted to show the difference between passive and active desiccant dehumidification systems. And then to achieve low dew point temperatures, our traditional DX and chill water systems are, can't uh, remove the moisture. We can't get the temperature low enough. So we have to incorporate an active desiccant equipment. Once again, want to emphasize to use the right input and output conditions. If you can, uh, once again, the more information you get from a uh, design perspective regarding the process, uh, pickup of sensible latent cooling, uh, you'd be much better off. Once again, I have to tell you all that. Uh, you guys know that, that uh, already. And then the last thing, just wanted to, um, you know, uh, HCI, uh, we're not just equipment sales. We do have service as well as uh, parts for after sale. We have specialized DOAS equipment, and then we also have passive and active desiccant dehumidification system. Once again, want to tout, tout HCI, uh, been around for a long time, uh, have a bunch of old people with a lot of experience that can help you uh, with your design and help you with your uh, projects, all right? And then just, um, you know, now we'll, we'll switch over to questions. I uh, want to just point out that, uh, you know, you might, might email myself or Gina if you require PDH credit. We appreciate if you can fill out the uh, survey uh, to help us, once again, as I said, with the, um, you know, uh, questions, uh, topics, future topics, uh, comments, et cetera, like that, applications that you need help with. And then just want to uh, point out that, uh, you know, back in the fall, we're back here in the fall where everybody uh, hopefully has, uh, you know, finished their vacations from the summer. Uh, the next webinar is going to be on Tuesday, October 26th. We're going to look at energy recovery systems where we don't have any cross-contamination, uh, starting to see a uptick in those types of system. Uh, this will be uh, based around uh, heat pipe uh, products where heat pipe has a refrigeration uh, base we run around uh, system, as well as a uh, you know, very robust hydronic run around uh, loop system where the uh, product is pre-engineered. They'll help you out with the, uh, the, the pumping skid, the coils, the controls, design, et cetera, like that. You know, full one-stop shopping for everything. All righty, let me switch to... Uh, doesn't look like we have any questions today, Jim. Oh man, I suck. <laughs> so, um, you know, if it's like uh, somebody has their hand raised. Okay, so here we go. Um, any what concerns with high temperatures at desiccant wheel during power outage? Recommended. UPS versus generator. Huh, that's a, that's a, a question to stumper. Um, 
I haven't seen uh, UPSs used on anything. Um, done several several projects with the backup generator. Um, maybe not specifically desiccant, but on some larger packaged units. Um, Right. Yeah, I would agree with that, that it's, you know, like a HVAC system on a standard rooftop unit, you can, uh, you know, do a, a dual power, um, you know, where the uh, heating and the fan, et cetera, is on the emergency generator, but the cooling is not. But if you have an application um, where you have a you know, manufacturing process where you have to, you know, keep uh, temperature and humidity, um, uh, you know, I can see adding, you know, whole desiccant humidification system, uh, you know, to that emergency generator UPS. Okay. I mean, that, that is a, that is a good question. I think it's something we should probably dig into. Yeah. So, um, how do we register for PDH? If, uh, if you're on the sign up sheet, we will be sending you a PDH. Uh, how do you send those out via email? Jim? Yes. Okay. Yep, I'll make sure, I'll check uh, Mitchell that you're on there with Gina. I'll check with uh, Gina. Okay. Um, high temp regeneration. Are you concerned about the wheel stopping and not having the ability to throw off the heat? Uh, yes, that's definitely a concern that is, um, you know, addressed in the control system of the um, of the of the you know active desiccant system, where they're um, what they're doing is they're you know uh, from normal operation uh, where the moisture level on the inlet side will change. What they'll do is um, monitor the leaving air temperature on the regen side, and then they will use that to. Um, modulate the electric heater with an SCR or the gas heat or a, a hot water valve. But, um, you know, it's definitely a concern that, um, you know, the, 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 the rotor of the wheel is designed for, uh, you know, 250 to 300 to uh, 20 degree uh, regen temperatures. But obviously if, uh, you know, things stop spinning and, and cooling off and going through their cycle, then that's a, uh, that's a, a problem. So they, they try to address that, um, you know, hence like CDI has the linkage for the chain belt, et cetera, like that. Okay. Uh, have, is somebody gonna say something else? Okay. Um, do you have heating plant options with your equipment? Lots of industrial plants use steam. What are the other options that you do have? Um, so steam is, is Definitely one of the options that we use. Um, we have a project right now at uh, Robert Wood Johnson Hospital in East Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, pretty large SEMCO unit, and we're using steam as the, the regen source. Uh, you can use direct, direct fired natural gas. Um, you can use electric depending on the size. Obviously, that would be a smaller unit. Um, but those are the three options that uh, that we've run across. Unless you have something else, Jim. No, that's uh, that's you know correct, Buck. I mean, d uh, d the other thing too, doing research for this is, um, and I kind of added on the regen side that uh, you know I try to qualify maybe hot water. Um, you know, just seeing uh, some. Uh, systems where they're using like solar heat um, on a on a you know not a, not a, an industrial or super low uh, dew point temperature where they're really trying to achieve low um, grains, but on you know sort of almost on the the bordering on passive uh, you know desiccant dehumidification where they're using. Um, uh, you know, re you know, uh, reclaimed heat or solar water um, for that region instead of the traditional, you know, high powered steam and electric and uh, gas. Uh, we have one in the chat here. It says it sounds like the process there would be entirely recirculated. 
I assume you can also introduce outdoor air into the space through a desiccant wheel. That is correct. Yes. So, um, so is there anything else before we, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, with the increased use of DOAS DDH for comfort conditioning, what other heat sources have you seen? The mention of solar or low temp regen heat is useful. Um, yeah, I mean, just as I, uh, you know, sort of expanded on with what Buck explained, um, you know, uh, you know, the most common uses, once again, are steam, electric heat, and uh, gas. But just, uh, you know, as I was researching, um, you know, for this presentation, I started seeing some, uh, you know, stuff on the internet, et cetera, like that, where they're using, um, you know, as I explained, you know, solar or regen heat, uh, uh, you know, reclaimed heat from, uh, you know, like a chiller or something like that um, for the, you know, for uh, regen. And once again, it's the, uh, the regen heat um, at these milder temperatures, I'll call them, uh, are therefore with, uh, you know, not as stringent uh, grain levels, you know, you, you, uh, to get down to really low uh, grain levels of like 10 and 20 degrees, you really need the high energy of the uh, steam, gas, and electric. How low of a temp source for regen can you go? In the applications that I've done, I haven't seen anything um, below 180 degrees for regeneration. Now, I'm just one person. I don't. I don't know what other people have have applied or done within the office. So. Any comment? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I, I'd agree 180, but that's not to say that it can be lower. I don't know. Well, 248 to 284 and 284 typical. That's from uh, Jim McCoy. He's done quite a few. Uh, desking jobs in his career. Well, I don't see any more questions. Um, again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, if there's anything we can do for you, please reach out to your um, HCNI sales personnel. And uh, if you don't have one, reach out to me and I will make sure you get one. So again, thank you. And uh, hope everybody has a great rest of your week. And again, we're going to uh, be doing heat pipes on October 26th. So look for that invite to come out here shortly. Again, thanks and everyone have a great week. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Buck. Thanks for your help. Thanks everybody. Yeah.